Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist for Illinois Extension, and I'm based here in central Illinois, here in Bloomington, and my specialty tends to be flowers of any kind. So annuals, perennials, cut flowers, Hello, that's what I love to, to grow. And I need to turn my volume down so you can hear me. Um, but I have some other great horticulturists here today to help answer those questions and teach us about vegetable garden insects in particular today. We have a special guest, but I want to kick it off with introductions from our uh, colleague Kelly to kick us off. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Alsip, and I consider myself a horticulturist extraordinaire. <laughs> I've asked to add that to the title of <laughs> Uh, position. I'm More still working on that. On that. <laughs> um, but uh, my specialty really is integrated pest management within uh, the state. Um, but I'm really passionate about pollinators and beneficial insects and kind of that ecological gardening. Um, I like growing vegetables too. I really um, love, um, you know, growing my own food. And even though it doesn't supplement huge part of my diet it's really fun to do and uh yeah that's it for me uh i i but you know i am extraordinaire right can oh, yeah. i be the horticulturist extraordinaire with can <laughs> we'll get you a t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> um well following the extraordinaire then i'll be <laughs> Horticulture educator from Champaign County. Um, and, you know, my interest is trees and shrubs, woody plants, arboriculture, forestry. That's kind of my uh, main area of expertise. But like Kelly, I do like growing my own food. So I grow a lot of vegetables at our house. And I'm also pretty interested in native plants and in gardening. So with that, I will kick it to our special guest, Ken, for an introduction. Hello, I'm Ken Johnson. I'm also a horticulture educator. Um, I cover Calhoun, Cass, Green, Morgan, and Scott counties. Um, so I'm based out of Jacksonville. Um, if you don't know where that's at, we're in kind of west central Illinois, about 45 minutes or so west of Springfield. Um, my, I guess, background expertise, so to say, would be entomology, insects, um, good, bad, really indifferent. Um, I like insects. That's, that's kind of my thing. Um, I'm also kind of fruits, vegetables, primarily vegetables, but those are kind of my things. I, I dabble in ornamentals, but I usually defer to, to others on that kind of stuff. Awesome. Well, if you guys have questions today regarding a vegetable garden pests or problems, definitely start adding those into the chat box, the comment box. Uh, or if you have any other gardening questions, we'll address those today too. But we want to stump Ken today with some really good insect questions. So <laughs> keep, get them in there. Um, but Ken, I think you had some photos to kind of kick us off with today, right? I do. So this morning, <clears throat> before the rain came here in Jacksonville, um, I went out and, and kind of looked around the garden to see if I could find any any pet or anything. And unfortunately, I don't have too much in my garden, but um, I did notice a few um, squash bug eggs on, on the pumpkins were grown. So here I've got some pictures um, of squash bug eggs. So if you're not familiar with these, this is what they look like. Um, if you've grown any kind of cucurbits, squash, pumpkins, um, cucumbers, you've probably encountered squash bugs where you're going to eventually. So these are what those eggs look like. They kind of lay them in clusters. Um, they can be on the upper side of the leaf, the underside of the leaf. Um, you can see that picture on the on the bottom right there. A lot of times you'll find them in the crotches of veins where they meet. Um, so that's a good place to look. Um, they're kind of this <clears throat> brick red, kind of brownish color. Um, eventually those hatch um, and those those first instar nymphs, those are going to be a, a picture on the left there. So they're kind of that green abdomen. Um, that black um, head and thorax area. Um, and then as they grow um, and molt and get larger, they kind of get this gray appearance, like the picture on the right there. Um, and these insects have piercing sucking mouth parts that are kind of like straws. Um, so they'll stick those into the plant and suck the juices out, kind of like a juice box. That's kind of how I like to explain it to people. Um, and eventually then they will become, the adults, adults are about five eighths of an inch long, um, kind of this dark brown, almost black color to them. And you can see on that picture on the right there, some of those, those little spots, like it's called stippling damage, on the, those yellow spots. That's that feeding damage uh, from those insects. They'll stick those mouth parts in there and then 
as they suck those juices out, those cells in that area will die. You get enough of these, um, you can have entire vines collapsing. They can get on the fruit um, and pretty much destroy the fruit, your pumpkins and stuff on it if you don't um, get a good handle on them. There's a couple different ways you can go about managing these. Um, so going out and scouting. So we talk about IPM and everything starts with scouting, going out and knowing what you've got going on in your garden. Um, so ideally do that at least once a week. Um, if not, you know, perfect world, you do it daily. Um, go out into your cucurbits, look at those leaves, turn over leaves, look for those eggs. If you find any eggs, um, you can squish them right there. You can tear off that portion of the leaf and dispose of it. Somehow get rid of those, those eggs or destroy them, get them out of the garden. Um, and as they start hatching um, and it start emerging and stuff, you can put boards and stuff out in your garden. Um, they can kind of congregate under those. So when you go out during the day, you can lift those up and look for those, kind of have them all in one place and then dispatch of them however you choose. Um, when it comes to kind of chemical controls for these, um, those work best when they are young, um, kind of those first, those first few in, uh, nymphal stages. Um, as they get larger and become adults, a lot of the chemicals we can use as homes aren't really all that effective um, in managing them. So getting on top of those populations um, is, is real important. You can also try using um, kind of floating row covers to try to keep them off from laying eggs in the first place. Um, but again, once you start getting blossoms on your fruit or on your plants, you're going to have to take the floating row cover off so they can get planted. So I don't know everybody else of mine kind of my cucurbits and stuff are kind of in full sling blooming and stuff. So right now floating row covers really wouldn't be an option for me. Um, and then in the fall, um, you know, making sure you're, if you have issues with these, making sure you're cleaning up all that plant debris. So if you have, you reduce some of those overwintering areas and kind of reduce those populations, hopefully um, for next year. Nice, good tips. And actually we had a question right before you started, Tammy asked, and said squash bugs are her biggest issue. How do you prevent them and get rid of them? So I'm glad you covered those. So if you have any other questions, Tammy, let us know about those. Hey, Ken, do you know what my secret is to squash bugs? I do not. Don't, don't grow squash. <laughs> that is a good way of avoiding them, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I joke, but Relieving the pressure from your garden for a year or two might really help in knocking down the population. Yeah, and that and crop rotation and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. and a lot of times you know, we talk about crop rotation, and in a home garden setting, that's a lot of times easier said than done. You only have so much space. Mm -hmm. Try to avoiding avoid planting some of these same crops in the same spot year after year. Kind of move them around the garden, or like you said, take a year off. Um, look frequent your, your farmer's market or find somebody who's grown zucchini. I'm sure they'll have plenty. Yes. Get. Yeah. Or cucumbers. Any of neighbor who will share. <laughs> well, I think yeah. that's a really good point. Okay, though. A question come in. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's a really ahead, good Ryan. point to, to think about in terms of crop rotation, sitting a year out. Like I think a lot of us don't think of that. You think you have to have, tomatoes somewhere or something. But yeah, I think that's a really good point. I've, I've done that a few times in the past, just not planted something for a couple of years because I had a pest issue, so. Yep. Um, we had a question come in, squash related in the same family. Um, they asked, what would be the reason a watermelon would be misshapen? Would there be any kind of uh, insect reason or anything that a, the final watermelon might be misshapen? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, the first thing I would think of maybe be pollination. You didn't get that that fruit all the way pollinated, so you don't have um, seed production throughout the entire fruit. So part of that fruit um, isn't developing properly. Um, you could have kind of inconsistent watering or not enough water, so they kind of deformed um, while it was developing. Mm -hmm. There could be insect feeding damage on there that, that kind of killed off part of that, that um, watermelon too. There could be a couple, several different reasons that could be happening that I could think of. Okay. Excellent. So as questions come in, whether they're vegetable pest related or anything else garden related, we'll address those today. But while we wait for some more questions to come in, I know the rest of us are also seeing other uh, insect things in the vegetable garden and other areas. And I think Ryan, you had a couple of, couple of ones that you've been seeing or you've been getting questions on. What were some mm -hmm. of those? 
Yeah, I've got a question for Ken. Um, you know, one of the things that's been new to me since I moved to Central Illinois in 2017 is cucumber beetles. And, you know, I moved here from Southern Illinois where I lived in the middle of the Shawnee National Forest. It really didn't have that much of a problem with them. Uh, whereas here, when I plant cucumbers in Central Illinois, they have just ravaged my cucumber patch over here. So uh, what are some control measures? Why why the change in, in that? Ken, you have any thoughts on, on that? And then what, what would we do? control those so some of our some of the beetles we call cucumber beetles are also called corn rootworms so depending on the species some of them you know different tech different crops have different common names so one of the issues with common names is that they can have multiple different names so that's probably one of the reasons why you're seeing more cucumber beetles in central Illinois we have a lot more corn compared to the Shawnee National Forest so they're migrating out of that um, you kind of into your cucurbit crops um, it's kind of management for them be kind of similar to, to your squash bugs so using those floating grow covers to keep them off initially. Um, and then again, as, as those plants start to bloom, you have to remove those. Um, and probably using some insecticides if you've got real heavy populations to kind of manage those. Um, when you're applying those, you're probably going to have blooms on the flowers, so you're going to want to make sure uh, you're applying those when you don't have active um, pollinators on there, so probably do that later in the, in the day, in the evenings, um, so you avoid some of those. Um, typically early, later in the evening, early in the morning. <clears throat> if I had to choose one, I would do um, in the evening, just give that time, give that pesticide some time to dry out before those bees are going to be coming back out in the morning. Um, it's it's kind of what I would do if I if I would be applying any kind of insecticide to a cucurbit or something. You know, and I suppose another strategy, I mean, I did the flooding row covers, started the season here, and, you know, now I'm, I'm in the flowering stage, so I've had to pull them off, but uh, you know, another strategy in all this is just it's a race to cucumbers at this point, you know, between cucumber beetles ruining everything and me getting a batch of pickling cucumbers. I'm just hoping that it's kind of what my bets are on this year is just trying to beat beetles to a couple harvests I can pickle. But yeah, I don't know about the rest of you, but kind of we roll around to, to August and stuff. I'm, at that point, I'm tired of picking cucumbers. So if the plants die, <laughs> I'm not too terribly upset if that happens. Um, don't cucumber beetles transmit bacterial wilt, Ken? Yes, so that's that's kind of the, the, the big issue with them. The feeding, their feeding can cause some damage, but kind of the big issue is that bacterial wilt. So they feed on that, they can transmit that bacteria, and then kind of <clears throat> sometimes almost overnight, your plants just kind of wilt, um, mm -hmm. fall apart on you. you have something like that, you can, you can kind of cut those stems and push them together and kind of pull them apart. And if you kind of get this, this streaming, this kind of those almost like snot, you get these strands between them. That can be a pretty good indication you've got some bacterial wilt or something like that in there. And at that point, once you, once your plants have that, you're better off just pulling those, um, get them out of there so it doesn't get spread to other plants. Well, and speaking of wilt, that's a great segue because we just got a question, a tomato um, question. Um, John commented, uh, wilted for three to four days tomato plant after a day of heavy rain. He thought bacterial blight, so he pulled the plant. He cut the stem looking for signs of blight, dipped the stem in water, and there's no bacterial bleed. Uh, what do you think? Other th other th ways or reasons a tomato plant would wilt even though there's plenty of water available. So there's some, some fungal wilt um, pathogens that, that can cause um, kind of wilting in plants. Um, for that, you would kind of cut open that stem, look for discoloration in that, <clears throat> in that vascular tissue. Usually it's going to be green, um, but if you have something like um, fusarium or verticillium wilt in your tomatoes, it will usually be kind of brown. Um, mm -hmm. Cross-section, look for that discoloration in there. Um, would be one disease I could think of. Uh, maybe they had some damage to the roots or something. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if those gone off. Soil borne, so he would not. He would definitely want to um, plant more resistant varieties next year and not plant in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Rotate, or or take the year off. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, <laughs> and I know I know when I've there's been times when I've gone out and, and pruned my tomatoes and, and thought I was being careful and I've accidentally snapped a stem and you go out a day or two later and the whole thing's dead and, and stuff. So mm -hmm. that that human. Air possibility too, or uh, or children are very good at accidentally <laughs> that you find later. So. 
Yes, yeah, we put a fence up around our garden to keep the children and the dog out. <laughs> <laughs> so, can I have white fly on my tomato plants? Yep. So that's so I'm, I started noticing a few of those on my plants. So tomato, I see a lot on tomatoes, and if you grow cucurbits, that's another one you tend to see a lot of them on there. And I think when I usually see them, it's kind of a little bit later in the year. Usually, when we're getting into August, when it's getting nice. Mm -hmm. Nice and hot and humid and a little bit drier. I kind of like those conditions. Um, and those, I mean, a lot of times, one of the recommendations is that is just kind of spray them off the plants a few times. Um, I personally have never really sprayed for them or done anything for them just because they're showing up later in the year. Usually at that point, I'm, you know, I, we've gotten quite a few tomatoes and cucumbers and all that stuff. So if we, if we, you know, production slows down a little bit, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's less you have to pick. Um, but again, that's another one you could, you know, if they get bad enough, you could spray for them um, as long as making sure you're not applying when, when pollinators are present and all that stuff. My professional technique is squishing them. <laughs> but I agree with you. I tend to see them later in the season when, you know, it's not really that big of an issue. Like last year at the food forest, we had all over the raspberry bushes and you know it was after harvest so it wasn't that big of a deal nice so i'm squishing yep. yeah that's funny when you get a lot of them you can go out there and kind of shake the plants and it looks like it's snowing sometimes and mm -hmm. so, so. okay let me hop over to youtube here because we've got a question there keep those questions coming in the comment box and we're going to get them answered for you um, Christy had a follow-up comment about her squash. She said she planted it later than normal and didn't seem to have as many. So that's a, a tactic to try to. Um, but then she also has an insect question here. So she said, this is my year of seeing um, purple carrot seed moth larvae on her dill, so which makes the seed heads unusable. So how do they winter over and are they predators trying to figure out controls? So purple carrot seed moth control on dill. What would that you is say? not one I am. I am purple carrot seed. I haven't heard of that one either. Oh, no, I was like, uh, I'm glad Ken is here. Because <laughs> <laughs> That's not one I'm familiar with, but if it's a caterpillar, I, I would think something like a BTK. Mm -hmm. She said it's the second year she's had it, it sounds like. Is she sure it's not a swallowtail? See if she because they're getting pretty prolific right now on people's parsley and you know any uh you know carrot like but we just saw them all over the wild carrot and <clears throat> on our nature hike this morning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I could take a picture and send it to Ken and he will get <laughs> before you start trying to kill it because yeah, it you don't want to kill it if it's a swallowtail mm-hmm so I, I'll preface this with I don't know anything about this insect. <laughs> if it's a caterpillar, you know, you could try. If it is your your purple carrot seed moth, you could try your your BTK something like that. That's going to be specific to caterpillars. It's not going to affect other um, insects. I would assume they're probably overwintering in the soil or on plant debris. So making sure you clean up well um, in the fall. Maybe moving your look if you kind of have it in a bed and you grow in the same spot every year. Maybe moving that. I'm kind of getting out of that that area, grow it in a pot somewhere else or something like that. Right. But again, that's, I'm not entirely sure because I don't know anything about it. So. She said she's positive it's not swallowtail and that Wisconsin is studying the spread of it. So we'll have to do some research. She said, she said I thought Ken knew everything. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I want to say that. I'm glad somebody else said that. I got some homework this afternoon now. Dumped him on that one. <laughs> Wait for her. <laughs> okay, let's see. Back over to Facebook. Um, question here. Um, I have green bean leaves that are holy, but they're still producing and growing. Should I be worried? So, so holes in the green bean leaves. What, at how much, let's say, how much damage should you start to be concerned about if you're getting holes in your leaves? I don't know if there's kind of a hard, um, fast number, but if you've got kind of the occasional hole or something like that, I wouldn't, 
be too worried about it. Plants, for the most part, are going to produce more leaves than they need, so they can withstand damage and losing some. Um, so, I mean, if you're getting, I would say, more than half your leaf, maybe a quarter of your leaf being eaten up, and then probably you would probably want to do something about it. But if it's if it's not too terribly bad, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, keep an eye on it. Probably keep a little closer eye on that stuff to see if it gets worse. But if it's, if it's not too bad, I wouldn't do anything. Um, you know, as far as what to do about it, a lot of it would depend on what's causing that damage. Is it, you know, caterpillar? Is it um, Japanese beetles? I saw some Japanese beetle, a little bit of da Japanese beetle damage on some of my green beans, little smaller holes, larger holes. I would think something more like a, a caterpillar or something like that. Mm -hmm. Could it be bean leaf beetle? Yeah, that would be one of the possibilities. Or flea beetles? Will they get on green beans? I can't say that I know. I know they're all over my eggplant. See, I haven't, I haven't seen any, but it doesn't mean I mean, when I've seen them, I just use the bit on my potatoes and, and tomatoes and stuff. I had them real bad earlier this year on those. So yeah, so it sounds like Nikki just kind of keep an eye on things for now and see, see if it continues. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, and you know that's it. It just reemphasizes the point that you you know. When you're scouting, really try to find the insect and um, picture of that insect or, you know, that way we can really give you good advice on how to control it because it would be different for bean leaf beetles or Japanese beetles. And But, you know, like I loved Ken's point, you know, it's okay to have a little bit of damage. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be perfect if you want to be organic and not use pesticides. Good point. And if, and if you're following IPM, you know, IPM, you're typically, especially for insects and stuff, you're trying to get those populations down to a level where they're not causing kind of significant damage to your plants. Typically, we're not going to completely eliminate them or get rid of them from you know, whether it's our vegetable garden or ornamental plants, what have you. We're getting those populations down so they're not causing real bad damage or noticeable damage. You're not typically trying to eliminate stuff because then you're starting to get into a lot of times real harsh chemicals and stuff that are going to have some little undesirable consequences for other insects and other things out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got another uh, question for Ken uh, from our colleague Bruce. He says, it's not insect related, but since Ken knows everything, here's a question for you. <laughs> uh, any tips for making your yard less hospitable to snakes? Every time he goes out to his raised beds, he sees snakes in his yard and garden and he's not a fan. So you got any tips for snakes? <laughs> I would say just embrace it. <laughs> so, yeah. Go eat your mice and everything else. You have to worry about those in your house. Um, I, <clears throat> so yeah, I don't really know a lot about snakes, but I would probably be uh, reducing some of the cover, some of the areas they can hide out in. So if you have brush piles or something like that, probably getting rid of those or moving those away from, from areas you don't want them. I don't know if Ryan or Kelly or either any of you have any ideas on that, but. Uh, My only instinct is what would the snake be eating and what could he, how, how could he possibly deter what the snake is eating? Mm -hmm. My only guess. But unlike Bruce, I would be ecstatic to find snakes in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah me too. If you're going to eat mice yeah. around my house, I'm all for it. Yeah, bring it. <laughs> yeah, that's why I've, I've always, I mean, I hate to admit this, but kind of promoted snake habitat around my around my house for mouse control and other reasons. And, um, you know, the things that we did was left brushy areas. I mean, that's where a snake likes to find some refuge. Um, so, I mean, from your standpoint, Bruce, maybe you want to clean up some of those brushy areas, kind of like Ken explained. But, um, you know, honestly, to like put it into perspective, the one thing that's nice about central Illinois and further north in the state is that there's not a venomous snake really to worry about. You know, where, in Southern Illinois, where I lived at, we had timber rattlers around, we had copperheads, you know, um, you know, all, you know, the whole suite of, you know, po venomous snakes in Illinois. So I don't know, just if, I know it doesn't help because I know there's a lot of people that just cannot stand the sight of the snake and I don't, you know, it's, it, it's hard to overcome that. But, um, but anyway, just to put in perspective, I mean, you could be in a lot worse shape. That could be a copperhead out there and not a garter. <laughs> I don't know. 
Good point. Uh, and we know Bruce has three kids in his house right now, so he could have them go out there and catch it. There you go. <laughs> I don't know if he if he feeds birds or anything like that, but that may be another thing. Getting rid of bird, mm. bird seed if that would probably be drawing in some some mice and other rodents and stuff that those snakes may be feeding on. Good point. Okay, we've had a couple of questions come in here. First one up from Michelle. Um, do you recommend cover crops for home raised bed gardens? And if so, what kind? Any experience with cover crops and raised beds? Well, I've, I've done a few cover crops over the years. And I, I mean, especially when you talk about crop rotation, if you've got plenty of room and you've got, um, you know, a space that can be fallow for a year, that's a great place to do a cover crop. Um, really, you know, in, in my experience, there's not a heck of a lot to them. I mean, you're basically, you know, seeding out one thing across a whole bed. So I really like doing them. Um, sometimes I do... You know, like I have a potato patch that we do potatoes that are probably getting close to being ready. I'll probably cover crop that after the potatoes come out. So then just for the rest of the year, it's a cover crop. Um, in other cases, just I didn't have a space, anything to go in, in in a space, you know, so I got everything else planted out. And so then I would throw a cover crop out and just cover crop that for the year. Um, if you guys have any favorites, um, some favorites of mine are really like buckwheat. It's one that grows nicely through the hot part of the year, flowers. Um, I've done crimson clover in the past is one that has a really pretty flower. Um, so it can actually look pretty cool. Um, you know, on the super simple side, just oats are real simple and easy to do cover crop. But, um, you know, in, in trying to figure out how to, how to do those or apply them, there's a really great... Um, online tool by the Midwest Cover Crop Council, I think, mm -hmm. called, and they have a selection tool where it's for Illinois, you can select by county, and it gives you the different planting dates for the different cover crops you could use, and it gives you some of the relative benefits of those cover crops. So is it a nitrogen scavenger? You know, does it hold, suck up nitrogen and keep it on the side? Does it loosen the soil? So that's, that's another kind I've used, or tillage radish. They really loosen your soil well and add nutrients and, and other things along with that. So you can look at all those different factors and figure out for what reasons do you want to add a cover crop. And here's the one that I get. I think they rate each cover crop on like a scale of one to five for each one of those characteristics they could provide. So that's that's kind of how I've ever gotten started in this. And, you know, that tool is kind of uh, built for, you know, large scale agriculture, conventional agriculture. Uh, but, you know, the dates and things are, are still the same for us as small scale gardeners and it still applies. And it's just a great way to kind of get your mind around when am I going to plant this? What do I need to, you know, what benefits do I get? And then um, I guess the, the tricky thing is at the end, how do you, how do you get rid of the cover crop or kill it, you know, so to speak, so you can garden next year. Um, some things will winter kill, um, like those tillage radishes, those just die over the winter time. So that's pretty easy. Um, others you do, you do need to mechanically stop them from going to seed, depending on what you're using or, you know, I've mowed or weed whacked or just tilled them in. So a lot of different options, but um, yeah, I, I think it, do you guys have any experience in home, the home gardening setting, but it, it's worked wonderfully for me and they control weeds in that space and just, you know, great thing to do in my opinion. Yeah, I tried some uh, last year in our garden. So I, I don't remember what all we had. I just got a mix. So a lot of the, the seed catalog, seed companies will sell kind of cover crop mixes for our scale, more like home garden. So I, we got some of those. I know there's some, um, the red clover, um, there was some of the, I got some tillage radishes in there because we had some areas with compaction. Um, mm -hmm. I got out a little too late for those. They didn't really do much. Um, but survived. I got some, a lot of stuff that would survive over the winter. Um, so I have just kind of something in there in this, before I planted in the spring, so keep some weeds down. I went in and, and sprayed everything. Um, just use Roundup to spray it all down, and then um, a plastic sled out and pulled my kids around the garden with it to, to kind of knock everything over and lay it down. And then just planted right into that. So probably try it again this year, try to get that stuff out a little bit later. And I, I just hand broadcast, so I had patches that were ridiculously thick in areas where I had almost no seeds. So, you know, <laughs> my broadcast <laughs> technique for, the, for that, but... Yeah, I found, I found hand broadcasting pretty pretty easy to do, but like Ken noted, you know, you do get a little bit of variability, but 
I mean, my technique for that is just having a prepared soil bed that was either tilled or all the stuff removed, uh, all the material removed and just kind of, yeah, it's, it's not rocket science, but it's trying to estimate for this, you know, one pound of crimson clover seed that I need to get on this 1,000 foot square space, you know, how do I make all this work? And you just have to kind of estimate and kind of get it out as best you can. And then I have like a big wide bed rake that I just used to kind of rake it in a little bit. And really for most of those small seeded cover crops that, you know, clovers especially, and that does a great job really. Um, and, you know, I, I don't mind if it's a little patchy sometimes because it's not a, a lawn that I'm trying to do here. You know, it's, it's just a cover crop. So. Okay. Our extraordinaire is back. We lost Kelly there for a while, but she's back. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue what happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were just wrapping up that cover crop question. I think we covered that pretty good. Um, let me head over to uh, YouTube. I see a couple questions here. Um, they said their leaves are turning yellow on cucumber, squash, and cabbage. Um, how can I repair the plant? Do I need more fertilizer? So yellow foliage on some cucurbits and cabbage, it says. What do you think? Hmm. Well, yellow foliage could mean a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we're all like, hmm. Could be several things. <laughs> it could be overwatering. Mm -hmm. That's or one thing. Or underwatering. It could be that it does need a little bit of fertilizer, but usually I, I, I tend to think people over fertilize their vegetables at times. Mm-hmm. But um, and then with the cabbage, depending on when they planted it, that just may be I mean, this is getting hotter and stuff, that just may be getting near the end of its life. That's more of a season crop. True. True. I mean, and sometimes also, you're oh go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Sometimes you're you could have feeding damage from insects that could cause maybe some yellowing. It, a lot of it just depends on how extensive that is. Um you know, on your on your cucurbits, if it's kind of a vine, that's vine is yellowing. You know, look more towards the base, see what's going on there. If it's individual leaves, you know, it's, it's probably gonna take a little more closer investigation to really see what's what's going on. Because yeah, like like I mentioned, there's there's a number of things that could that could be causing that yellowing. Yeah, some photos would probably be helpful for that. Yeah. Um, and then they also asked a follow-up question. Uh, their squash has not produced this year. And I think we talked about this in the last live too. Um, anything they can do or any particular reasons why squash might not be producing yet? If they've got flowers and they don't have any fruit, a lot of times, or, or cucurbits, um, the first flowers they send out are male flowers. So cucurbits have male separate male and female flowers. So if you get that flower and it's just a straight stick, that's going to be the male flower. Female flowers are going to have a little swelling um, at the base of that flower. That's what's going to be become the fruit. Um, so if you've got flowers, I would check to see what types of flowers you have. If, if they just started flowering, more than likely they're all male. Um, in a week or two, those female flowers will start coming in. If you have female flowers um, and you're not getting any fruit production, um, you could have poor pollination. I mean, the pollinators present. You may have, you may, may have had bad weather conditions because uh, those cucurbit flowers are typically open for a day, uh, and then they're they're kind of done. So if you had rain or something where those pollinators weren't out, they may not have visited. Um, you know, it could have been too dry. Those fruit just aborted. They, there wasn't enough water to support that fruit, so the plant aborted them. Yeah, and if that squash, if it's the same squash plant that has yellow foliage and is stressed, then it's obviously not going to produce uh, much fruit also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the difference between male and female flowers is pretty easy to pick out, like Ken kind of, mm -hmm. so take a look. I mean, that, that'd be definitely the first things I'd check because it's, it's kind of fun to even look at. Like, I like to kind of look at my vines and try and pick out which ones are going to be fruits and not so once you kind of see it i think it's pretty easy to identify again kind of fun to look at actually i got some pictures here i'll, I'll throw <laughs> my powerpoint and i can show you what they look like awesome because you can harvest those male flowers you really only need two or three of them on the 
vine to properly pollinate the female flowers. And, you know, those male flowers are considered a delicacy. Mm -hmm. so, pe they, so people eat them like on a salad or? Mm -hmm. Or they stuff them with mm -hmm. stuff yeah. and fry them, you know, anything fried. I mean, I don't know <laughs> like the, the most taste. I mean, I don't know if they have like a squash taste, but yeah. So you see the, the pictures? Yes. So that, that picture on the left there, you can see that swelling at the base of the flower. That's the female flowers. This is a pumpkin that'll eventually turn into a pumpkin. So that swelling basically looks like a miniature fruit. So the cucumber flower, that, that swelling is going to be a little more elongated like a cucumber. And on the right there, these are the male flowers. You can see that's just a straight stalk. It's, it's not as thick anywhere on that stem, on that flower stem compared to the female. Yeah, you can almost see the little tomato stem, right? Or, sorry, pumpkin stem right there. I can just see that. Yeah, yep. Like mm -hmm. That's the ovary, yep. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so we've had some questions come in, so let me scroll back up here. Uh, Bob asks, uh, any idea what would be making my ferns turn brown? Is it lack of water? Probably that would be my first. That would be my first answer, especially considering the dry uh, conditions we've been having. Anybody else have any other thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, same thing, Candace. I, I we have two by our front door in container. It's like they dry out in an hour. Or two. Mm -hmm. Now I I'm amazed at how every time I go by those things, it seems like they need to be watered. And ferns are real sensitive if they dry out. So. Yeah, yeah, I have some in hanging baskets on my front porch that I've kind of been slacking on watering, and they're definitely. And, and I think a factor. <laughs> I think a factor to maybe consider too is like how much wind they get. Mm -hmm. Top of just sun and heat and everything, that wind I think is why it is really. That's like the windiest part of my yard that we have our our ferns sitting at. So. Yeah. Very true. Yep, so I would just step up the water in a little bit, Bob. Um, I'm just not the biggest fan of ferns. I think they're hard to take care of. You know, when I worked in a greenhouse, I was awesome at ferns. <laughs> you know, I, they, they were watered, they had the humidity, they had the light. But when I'm trying to grow a fern inside my house or, you know, everybody wants those big, beautiful ferns hanging off their porch, I just... You know, unless you are a really diligent waterer, I think it, it can be a difficult thing to grow in Illinois. Yeah, I try every year. I don't know why, but <laughs> yeah, we, so we do a lot I always have good intentions, but I I will switch it out eventually. Maybe sure. we should say what would be something different that they could grow. Because we're always trying to grow these big lush Boston ferns, and we just don't seem to have the climate to support that. Yeah, you know, what I did last year is I swapped them out for my hanging baskets and I did um, Wandering Jew, which is a tropical kind of trailing plant. And I should have done that again because that worked out pretty pretty well. I didn't have to water them as much and they kind of like, they were shaded, but they had, still had light coming from the sides. So that I'll probably do that again on mine. What would you suggest, Kelly? I don't know. I meant, you know, I'm, I'm 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 big into the jungle cacti. I think they just look so cool and interesting, but they're probably not going to be, you know, a substitute for Boston fern. Yeah. I think maybe other ferns might do better than Boston fern, maybe like a fern. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and if we if we start looking at ferns outside of containers, you know, I just added a bunch of ferns to our landscaping mm -hmm. and and some even take like full sun and, and they're just minor tiny, but I've seen mature ones in a lot of gardening settings that are just spectacular for the foliage and everything else. And it's not like you ever lose that foliage during the growing season. You know, you've got it all year. It's not like something that flowers for two weeks and then you just have leaves. I mean, the foliage are why you plant it. So um, I highly recommend them in the landscape, in the ground where they're planted in the right spot. Um, it's just the potted ones that are so, so tough. Yeah. Yeah, my ones and I have way more in the ground that do great because they have get a lot more water, obviously, than my poor hanging baskets. So that leads to a really great question for Ken. I have a ostrich fern on the side of my house. I actually 
actually think they're gorgeous, but I hate them because they are Japanese beetle magnets. Um, Haven't seen a single Japanese beetle on them yet. Japanese beetles have been out, what, three weeks now? I think so, yeah. Yeah, around that. So um, I just feel like, are we having a not bad year of Japanese beetles? Because last year it seemed like they were crazy. Yeah, I've only seen a handful um, in our yard, but I don't. We don't have a lot of stuff in our yard that they really like. I mean, I've seen so our vegetable garden. We've I've had some. They've been clipping some of the silks on the sweet corn, but not enough that would really be worried about it. A few spots here and there are some green beans, but really don't have a lot. At least where I live in Jacksonville, in my yard, I haven't seen a lot in the last several years. I know Jacksonville, hearing from people, it seems to be real patchy around town. So some people are completely inundated, and then other the town like where I live. There's barely any. So I think Japanese beetles, are, their, their distribution is kind of patchy to begin with. Um, and then, but you know, like um, insect populations will just kind of fluctuate over to the peak. And then you know, those predators and stuff will catch up with them and then they'll, they'll fall. And you can just kind of have this ebb and flow. And I think a lot of places, um, you know, you have that initial Japanese beetle infestation. They show up, they're real bad for 10, 15 years. And then kind of over time, those populations kind of, they start decreasing and they just kind of level off and they're not nearly as bad as they, as they were when they first showed up. So, you know, places like, you know, I think there's parts of Iowa where they're real bad and showing up in Colorado and stuff. Those places are going to have them real bad um, compared to where most of Illinois, where we've had them for, for a while now. Time, yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. Let me see what we've got question wise. Um, question here. They said they saw a video uh, regarding bell peppers, and the video said to cut the growing tip when there are four to six true leaves on it. She said they did this, and it didn't make the plant any fuller. So is that something you would recommend on a bell pepper to, to pinch it back? And have, you, have any of you ever done that on a pepper plant? I've never, I've never pruned any peppers. I don't, I just go and I don't touch them. I mean, I can understand why you you pinch that growth tip back. The idea would be to get those side buds to pop, mm -hmm. but I don't know why that wouldn't have happened in their case. Yeah, yeah, because typically when you take out the growing point, you're going to force the, the growth below it to kind of bush out. But um, yeah. don't they do that with Brussels sprouts when you know Brussels sprouts are really long crop in Illinois, and by the time they're almost ready to harvest, you tip it out, and then they get bigger. Yeah, I've never heard of tipping a pepper plant before. I have not either, and I've never tried it. Yeah. I've, I've heard of it in, like, in tomatoes, like, later in the year. Um, you kind of cut that top off, and that way it puts all this energy into to producing those tomatoes so they ripen up before, um, you know, we get a frost and stuff. But mm -hmm. it's later in the year, not early. Yeah. So, yeah, we don't have a great answer for you on that one. We we do, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that. We haven't, we haven't done it, so... Uh, okay, and then another question from them. Uh, they have several double rows of Sharon's that die out uh, after about four to five years. It's And they said it seems the single rows of Sharon's last a lot longer. Is there a reason? So double varieties of rows of Sharon versus single varieties of rows of Sharon. Anybody have any expertise there? The only thing I can think of is maybe they're less cold hardy. That's what I was thinking too, is that whatever the cultivar or the variety that is double is is not as uh, vigorous or not as cold hardy. Yeah. Because sometimes when they're doing those genetics work and they're selecting for, you know, a more double flower, they lose disease mm -hmm. resistance or cold hardiness and, um, you know, they come on the they come in the industry so fast that they're not always trialed um, to see. But that's my yeah. only guess. <laughs> that was my thinking too. It has to be just something with the variety of single versus double. Yeah. So I don't think it's anything you're doing. I think it's just that particular variety that you're growing. 
Um, let's see, a question from Wendy. Uh, I'm growing zucchini and I've gotten one mature one so far. The other beginning zucchini look like they are starting to grow, but then uh, the but then the end where the flower was turns yellow and the zucchini shrivels up. She needs help with her zucchini. So it sounds like they're growing, but then where the flower was on the 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 end closest to the flower turns yellow and shrivels up. Any ideas what that might be? I had some of that early this year in some of my zucchini. I think part of that. So I think there's a couple of reasons that can happen. One could be again that pollination; those flowers didn't get fully pollinated. That that, so that tip didn't fill out, and the flower, the plant aborts it. Um, you could also have some some moisture stress there where they're not getting um, enough water um, and causing that fruit to abort. That end end part to abort too. We might kind of guesses on that. So here's a question for the group. Um, we've talked a lot about like poor pollination today. So you know. Some things we can do to to try and deal with that and it's i think it probably would be next year that we'd be setting up to do that but, you know what are some suggestions you guys would have to increase so i would i always oh go ahead i always uh plant flowers in my in with my vegetables i don't go this is space is only designated for vegetables and this space is only designated mm -hmm. for flowers i think the closer you can get flowers to the vegetables, the better off you are. It will not only attract pollinators, but it'll attract beneficial insects that are also gonna help you manage those pests. Um, another thing when it comes to like squash bees, um, you know, not tilling up your ground because that's where they're overwintering. Um, so that's, Two tips, but this is definitely a Ken question, and I'm sorry. I took over. That's right. So, yeah, I'm providing those those floral resources on my garden. Um, we planted cosmos one year, and they just they reseed themselves readily. So we have cosmos coming up in our vegetable garden. A lot of the herbs we have, I'm not really an herb person, so I just let them go to flower and and stuff. Um, so we've got that. We've got some flower beds relatively close to our. So we can have those. Those other floral resources available so when our vegetables aren't blooming there's stuff for them to feed so you can keep those pollinators around um, providing that habitat so like i said that, that tilling if you have ground nesting bees you till that up you destroy their nest they're not going to come back the next year you're killing all those overwintering bees potentially um you know in horticulture and particularly in ornamental stuff we talk about mulch we want to mulch everything but providing some of that bare ground so you do have those, any of those areas for those ground nesting bees I know in our, we kind of have a designated garden for our cucurbits or cucurbit patch. Um, and if you walk out there now, we've got all kinds of little kind of pencil sized holes that I think are probably those squash bees where they pollinate, but I don't mulch anything in there. It's like when those, those cucurbits get big enough, they're going to cover that ground. You're not going to have much as far as the weeds. Um, you know, obviously, the pesticides, I think a lot of people, we get a little too crazy with pesticides, insecticides in time. As soon as we see a bug, we want to spray it again. Being willing to to lose some damage to your plants. Obviously, if you're if you got a lot of damage in the head, you need you may need to use the pesticides. But you know, cutting back on that, and if you do apply them, making sure you're applying them when um, those pollinators aren't active. So again, in the, in the evening or early in the morning before they really get going um, and stuff. Okay. Well, we've got about ten minutes left, and we got a couple questions on deck here. So let me head over to. Um, YouTube uh, question here. Squirrels are eating all of their tomatoes. They planted basil around the tomatoes since someone said that might deter pests. They've sprayed cider vinegar and Tabasco in a spray. Uh, would cayenne pepper work? So tips on keeping squirrels off of tomatoes. What do you got? So in my garden tomatoes or squirrels ate almost all of our tomatoes last year. Um, so one thing we did this year is we stopped feeding birds, stopped putting bird seed. I have barely seen a squirrel in our yard. So, really? so I think that's one thing we've done now. We don't have any tomatoes that are ripe yet, so that remains to be seen if, if they show up. Um, that was one big thing we did. Last year, I got to the point I was putting um, plastic grocery bags over the, the fruit clusters just to try to keep the squirrels off. Those filled with water and then the... 
<laughs> they got real hot and the plants just kind of melted and got real nasty. <laughs> Squirrels didn't get them, so it was, it was good enough for me. But, I think um, I think you hit the hit the point right on the mark because you know I'm always like you know I don't ever have any squirrel damage and I grow tomatoes all the time and I know there's squirrels in the trees but I think it's that not killing birds or or making sure that bird feeders yeah so any so they asked about any like deterrence has anybody had Oh, sorry. I think I froze there for a bit. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so did we get the squirrel one covered, do you think? So as far as deterrence, I I think a lot of the, the deterrence, especially the ones that smell, I think those are, I don't know if any of those are really listed for um, food crops. Uh, I think those are more ornamental. I, I would, if before you use any kind of deterrent, whether that be odor type one or, or even a feeding one, I would make sure you can use that on edible crops, plants you plan on on eating. I think a lot of those are labeled mainly for ornamentals. Yeah, I definitely don't have any scientific research to back this one, but I've seen on some of the gardening Facebook groups and places, uh, some folks showing uh, little shiny strips of paper or plastic that are meant to scare away birds and things uh, have, they've noted have worked for squirrels. So I don't know if maybe you could try those. They just kind of, they're little streamers that kind of dangle in the wind and maybe you can hang it off your tomato cage. Um, you know, it's not always practical, but I've had really good uh, squirrel control with dogs. You know, my pet dog really <laughs> loves to chase squirrels. And so maybe it's time to get a puppy. I don't know. But <laughs> That's that's been about the most effective squirrel deterrent I've ever had was was my dog chasing them off and things. But we we feed birds and man, I, I, we also feed squirrels because whether they can eat or not, there's seed that falls in the ground and those squirrels are out there every day. And um, so just recently here we got a window feeder for birds and they're really awesome. It's just a little plastic tray that suction cups to your window, and then you've got a bird right there. You know, certain birds aren't brave enough to come up there, but you know some of the Wrens, stuffed titmouse. Um, there's there's a number of them that come up and feed out of that. Well, this morning when I got up and walked down to the kitchen, uh, there was a squirrel sitting in that thing, <laughs> eating away, happy as could be. So, yeah, I, I'm almost thinking it's time for us to scale back on some of the feeding because we have so many squirrels around. But I think my garden is just far enough away from the house. It's probably a couple hundred yards away. Uh, I don't really have squirrel problems in the garden. Knock, knock on wood. They're probably out there eating tomatoes right now. And I just have <laughs> I don't know. And one thing they could try if they've only got like one or two plants, you could try kind of caging it, so to speak, getting some kind of netting, like bird netting or something like that to protect them that way. That may discourage them. If they wanted to get in bad enough, they're going to find a way, but it may discourage them from trying to, to get into your plants. Yeah, squirrels are a force of nature. To try and stop them is sometimes really hard. They can get a better. But no, I agree, Ken. Sometimes it's just a little bit of a, a fence around something to just kind of make it hard for them, and they're going to go off to something else. So. Okay, excellent. Um, one other one over here on YouTube. Um, what would make a potato plant die? Um, do you want to touch on maybe potato beetles, Ken, while we're on that topic or other reasons why a potato plant might fail? So you're, like you're caught out a potato beetle and stuff, that's, that's kind of feeding on, on the foliage, on the leaves. So um, those larvae are kind of orangish. They've got black spots along the sides, um, kind of almost a kind of grub-like. Um, and then they can do quite a bit of feeding damage. The adults um, are going to be lined. Um, stripes on their on their on their bodies and stuff. So yeah, they can do um, quite a bit of damage. I, I would think you probably would have noticed those beetles and stuff on the plants, though. Mm -hmm. They're feeding that, and you probably would have seen all the the frats or the poop all over the place um, if it was it was something like um, potato beetles or something like that. And if I mean, depending on where you're at in the state, I know my potatoes are starting to to kind of decline a little bit. They're probably getting ready to getting close to harvest. Those those vines are starting to die back. So depending on where you're at, that just may be, if it's just re recently happening, they may be ready to about time to harvest them. Good point, yeah. Um, we had some potatoes rot in our garden this year, and 
Um, so they just never really grew. They just rotted away. And this goes back. I never cut my potatoes into pieces. I always plant the whole potato. I mean, I, they're, it's cheap. Uh, and I know that, you know, if you have a huge garden, you probably want to do the pieces. But I just feel like when you do the pieces, then you have more chance of getting the rot from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, got, if you cut the pieces, you got to make sure you cure them. Yes. So they can, uh, heal over, over that cut. And I think that's something that people skip. I think they realize they have to get the eyes, and then they don't let them heal over before they plant them and then you're going to get root rot. You know, I, I always cut the pieces, but because that's how I first ever did it. <laughs> Can't say it's the, you know, because it works great or anything. Um, but so like being cheap, <laughs> but you have a really good point, Kelly, that um, it doesn't cost that much. You just do the whole potato too. Um, so I don't know. It's maybe it's an extra step I should reconsider, but um, I just want to say that like my potatoes, I of course cut in, did that but man they were super late to come up this year they had a lot of problems and just i thought the whole patch was going to fail for a while and then finally they came up so i don't know if there was you know, just overly wet spring maybe was not favorable for them or what but uh, it's been a rough year and I, don't, I don't think i'm going to have an awesome harvest from just kind of poking around in there looking now i might like ken mine are starting to show they're not looking great it's heating up they're going to be done soon and so I, know, I guess I'll have fingerling potatoes this year. Baby potatoes. The sweet potatoes are doing really well. Mm -hmm. That's good. With this heat, they're probably yeah. Yeah, I, I I love growing sweet potatoes too because Ken kind of mentioned this with the cucurbits too. Um, it's I keep it bare soil there, and it's just a race between the weeds and the sweet potato vines. You know, like I you know with I I hoe you know till it with the hoe as much as I can, and now's the point where I can kind of stop, and those sweet potato vines are just turn it into a jungle that blocks out weeds and does everything else, so. Okay, we've got two final questions before we wrap up today. Um, Amy asked, uh, my stilby's done blooming and now the leaves are turning brown. Should I cut it down or leave it? So yeah, Amy, usually if I do notice brown leaves on my stilby every once in a while, I'll go through and kind of cut off, just cut those off. If they're still green leaves, I leave them. But yeah, I do kind of go in and clean it up. It still be like a moist shade. So when we have a period where it's really dry uh, and I'm not doing any extra watering, I notice the, the still be will dry up pretty quick. We don't have it. So yep, go ahead and cut it back. And then lastly, this is a great one to end on with Ken. Um, Sally asked, um, um, she was late, so she's not sure if we discussed this yet, but we haven't. Um, she picked out two large hornworms and two baby hornworms off of a raised bed of tomatoes. She's still scouting, but they ate the tops of the plants as they <laughs> tended to. So why don't you finish us off, Ken, with some tips on hornworms and what to do and what to look for. Yeah, hornworms, so you're going out hand picking is good. When they're small, they're camouflaged pretty well, so it can be kind of hard to see them. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to spray using like that BTK, um, that you know, that's specific to caterpillars, is not going to affect our other uh, our other insects out there. Would be a good spray. Um, and a lot of times, people have had a kind of a sacrificial tomato plant where they would kind of let the hornworms have them because they want those those moths that they're going to turn into. Um, so going out hand picking, I think, <clears throat> would probably be kind of kind of your best bet. Um, mm -hmm. I've read, I've I've never personally done this, and I don't know if this is the case, but I've read that um, you can fry those up and they taste like a green tomato. So you could, <laughs> you, could you could try eating those too. I, I wouldn't eat them if you've sprayed your plants or anything like that. But <laughs> there's always that, that extra protein source for your tomato fed hornworms. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Well, good tip. So we're going to wrap it up for the day. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to Ken for joining us and being our insect expert. We appreciate it. We stumped him a couple times, though. <laughs> um, Thanks for having me. <laughs> I hope you'll join us. Our next show is going to be on July 29th. So in two weeks, we're going to be back with another special guest, Diane Pleva who works with our uh, plant clinic on campus. So she's going to answer all your questions about tree pests 
and diseases. So we'll switch gears from vegetables to trees. So hopefully we'll see you then. We also will get a link in our comment box for our extension horticulture group on Facebook. So if you have questions that come up between shows, you're welcome to join that and answer and ask them there. So thanks everybody. Have a good rest of the week and happy gardening.